uh, many passages in the Bible, uh, many times Scripture is taken out of context. And, uh, and there are passages of Scripture that we can uh, truly agree with, and then there's passages of Scripture that we like to argue with. How many of you find yourself there once in a while? You say, I'm not going to raise my hand, argue with God, but sometimes we look at passages of Scripture. Taff, you could turn the monitors just a hair up. And, uh, uh, but this is one of those passages. Now, again, just to, before we read this, remember that uh, Christ is talking to His disciples in the Sermon of the Mount, but He's also talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees who uh, thought that they were better than anybody else and better than everybody, that everybody around them was below them. I mean, they are the elite. They are uh, what you would call in our society, the Soros, the Gates, the Zuckerbergs, the, um, those type of people uh, that, that think that they are the elite people. Aren't you glad in God's eyes God doesn't see status, God sees sin and saint? God sees salvation, relationship, sin are headed to hell. That's what God sees. But He is talking to them, and, and, and so in this passage of Scripture, Jesus Christ brings out some profound truths. As we'll say, see in a second, in fact, he, this is the first of six illustrations that the Lord Jesus Christ uses against them. In verse 21, it says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, that thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time he, uh, adversary, uh, deliver thee to the judge. The adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou shalt be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost furthering. Now, if you look at the very first part of verse 21 and then the first part of 22, if you have a habit of underline, underline the phrase, ye have heard, but I say unto you, we will see this six times in this passage of scripture, hey, you have heard, but I say unto you. Now, again, in the text this morning, he continues to teach on the righteous standard that God expects and requires for those that are saved, for the Christian, the saint, to have fellowship with him. Uh, he continues to point out their, their uh, flaws and misguided precepts and really interpretation of Scripture. He is bringing to light really their hypocrisy in their lives and in their teachings. Now again, this is the first of six illustrations that are being used that Jesus Christ uses in this Sermon on the Mount. Now each of these illustrations, he mentions what they had heard in old, in essence addressing what the prophets had told them, what the writings in Scripture were, and what he expects, and really to say, okay, now let me just explain it because you're misguided. Your, what your thought is and what my thought is is two different things. You say, well, one is right and one is wrong. Jesus is the Word, so He is right. And He says, I have some things to say. Now, to each of these issues, Jesus offers a true interpretation of, uh, of what is revealed here and how we ought to view them, view them in responding to them. Now, 
uh, we are dealing with this portion of Scripture on murder. Let me ask a very simple question. Is murder wrong? Is murder wrong? Is taking an innocent life wrong? We know abortion is wrong. We know that the genocide is wrong. We know that murder is wrong. Now, we're going to discuss all that. You say, well, wait, I, 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 how about capital punishment? We're going to talk about that. But murder is wrong. They all knew that murder was wrong. It wasn't like, and he's saying, listen, you've heard in, of old, and so we're dealing with this. And, but Jesus Christ expands the realm of accountability for murder beyond what most of us, even in our day, perceive as not as bad. But he said, listen, let me bring some things out that are just as bad as murder in the eyes of God. Oh, you guys know murder, but let me bring some things out to you. Now, the commandment rehearsed here in verse number 21, and you've heard that it was said by them of old, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, this, of course, he is going back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, the Ten Commandments, and he says, Thou shalt not kill. You know that, you've heard it, you believe it, you teach it. So, as you think about this, he says, Let's consider this for a moment. And so, you look at the precept here. The Lord reminds them of the commandments of God. This is something that all the Jews knew. And this is something that we know. We know that murder is wrong. If you were to look on, online or pick up the paper, you're going to find a case of murder. Someone was killed last night, uh, whether it be in a protected city uh, where guns are not allowed like Chicago or New York or one of these safe cities, uh, the murderous capitals of the world, you're going to read about someone being murdered. We know that's wrong. So Jesus does not question or make light of the commandment. He doesn't say, no, listen, now you've heard an old, but, but I'm saying to you, no. He doesn't make light of the commandment. He says, you heard it, you know it to be true, and to be honest, I agree 100% with you. Murder is wrong. That's what Jesus Christ is saying here. As we'll discover in a moment, he even seeks to expand their perception of what constitutes murder. Now, as we consider the words of the Lord, I'm reminded of the need for God's word to be expounded, and men need to see themselves accountable to the word of God. You know, when we say we're accountable to God, we're accountable to the word of God. What guides us? The Bible guides us. We read it, we heed it, we believe it, and we do the things that God's Word teaches. So we need to humble ourselves and be guided by the words of God's Word. How many agree with that? So Jesus is saying, I'm giving you the truth. I'm giving you God's Word. You've heard all of these things and you know that it's wrong, but I'm going to tell you some things that are also important. You know, we live in, an, in a society that, quite frankly, is ignoring and has forgotten this commandment. You, you look at the elites and you look at people around society, there is no value to human life. Animal life's different. Animals have tremendous rights. You take eagles, you take turtles, you take owls and whales and, and the little fish that are in the, in the uh, reservoirs and some of the channels uh, and canals out in California and they can't irrigate because we have to protect these little fish. But let's go ahead and murder babies. The elderly that are in nursing homes, they do society no good, take their lives. Euthanasia. We place... Really, now I'm not saying we, I say society and, and worldly society places no value on life. How many have ever visited a nursing home? 
Miss Julie, you work in a, in a nursing home and, and you, have, uh, you have those in a nursing home that some uh, just call out all the time. We were talking about it yesterday, Brother Wayne, and, and Marianne was in a, in a nursing home for a little bit and she said, oh my word, she said it, it, it was getting bad. You know, here, honey, come here, honey, come here, honey, come here, honey. Their minds are gone. They're elderly. Their minds are gone or they're, they're screaming out for someone to come. And, and it takes a special type of person to work there. And they go, and everything's okay. Everything's fine. And you look at this person and you say, uh, that person's mind is gone. They can never contribute to society. They are taxing on us. And, and, and therefore, let's just end their life. That's murder. When God's time for that person's life to end, God will choose that time. But we place no value on it. If I'm driving down the road, a side road, I won't on an interstate. But if I'm driving down a side road and there's no one behind me, or even if there is, and I see a turtle crossing the road, how many of you do this? You will pull over, get the turtle, and help it across. I've done that. Now, we're not talking about cats. I mean, we're not talking about raccoons here or possums uh, on this. Let me, let me say this. If you swerve and hit an animal like that, a possum, a raccoon, and someone sees that, you can get in trouble for that. You can go to jail for that. But you can walk into an abortion clinic and... Now, let me, as a side note, we will be discussing the, the proposals here in church, especially Proposal 3. It is the most outreaching, wicked, vile proposal ever put on a ballot in Michigan. And we need to return back to our rights. We need to return back to the rights of a mother. Now, I'm not being unkind. I'm being biblical here. You have the right to abstain from any type of activity that would cause a lady to get pregnant. Once you get pregnant, you've lost all rights. You have the right to carry that baby. You have a right to uh, make sure that that baby is born healthy and someone can take and, and, and adopt that baby or you can keep the baby. That's your right you have. Do you know in this proposal that... Anybody can take a, 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 a young lady in or a lady in and perform the abortion, not just a doctor, anybody. Listen, that's wicked, any type of murder. But as a society, we place no, no uh, any type of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, concern or, or uh, the commands of God or even the importance of life. Why? Because when you remove God, you remove anything that is moral. Listen, children are wonderful. Yes, they cry. They eat. You know, babies do about three things. They eat. Well, four things. I don't want to be like the president and... Uh, and, and so I shouldn't even put a number. They do a few things. That way, if I get it wrong, you know, um, I'll, I'll say, Mitch, did you hear what your president did? This uh, I always get myself in trouble. I'm going to lose all the members. He said, I have two words. Two words for you. Made in America. Now, I hate to say that's three words. Even I know that's three words. And the caption's like, who's going to tell him? <laughs> who's going to tell him on that? They, they must get a kick out of Okay, that's, I'm going down, I'm digressing very quickly here on this. But babies eat, babies cry and laugh, babies dirty their diapers. Maybe they dirty, eat, laugh, dirty, eat, laugh, and they sleep. But they give you joy, they talk to you. Listen, babies are wonderful. I could not imagine taking the life. My nephew was sharing just a, a, a horrible story of a case they have in Kent County, and I won't go beyond that, but uh, I better, I'm digressing quickly, but capital punishment would be perfect for these people. Anybody can make a child, but not anyone can be a dad to a child or a mother to a child. But we put no sanctity on life. 
Now, again, Jesus is, Jesus is talking about the perception. Now, regardless of the perception or application that humanity has for human life, God has commanded that we do not have the right to kill or murder. And uh, we'll talk about capital punishment in a moment. Now, the penalty here. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, the prophets of old warned of the dangers involved in murder. This was a serious crime in the eyes of God. Many times in Scripture, the Lord declares that those who were guilty of murder was to have their life taken as well. If you were to look at Numbers 35, we won't turn there, Numbers 35, you will find that God sets up six cities of refuge that they could go to until the trial or until they were heard out of what had taken place. But six times he talks about how a person, if they murder with, a, with iron, if they murder with wood, if they murder with a stone, if they murder with uh, their hands, what was to take place to them? Now, this is different from an accidental death. This is different from if you were, to, uh, you were to kill someone by accident. It wasn't premeditated. It wasn't on purpose. It was an accident. That's completely different. He is talking about the willful act of murder. He said is wrong. Now, it has been really a blight in our society. And every time you hear the news, someone else is killed. And this whole attack on officers is ridiculous. You know, you watch these little clips and, and the person, uh, you know, they get pulled over for speeding or whatever. And can I have your license? I'm not going to give you this. And there's a scuffle. And, and I'm not saying all police officers are good. There's some bad ones, but there's bad doctors. There's bad everything. But listen, if you just do right and you just hey, here's my license, here's this, and you talk. But to, 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 to try to just say, hey, every officer's bad, take their life. That is wrong. We, we know this, but he's talking about here the sanctity of life here. Now, I know there's a lot of debate concerning capital punishment in our day. I don't think it would be much of a debate here in this room of capital punishment. Now, I don't know where each of you stand, but I do know where God stands on capital punishment. Unfortunately, our state is a state that does not practice capital punishment. It's by law, we do not practice capital punishment. That is a blight on Michigan, along with the governor and several others. But the Bible does say in Genesis 9, 6, whoso sheddeth man's blood... By man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. We live in an age that affords the offender more rights than the victim. The victimizer, in many cases, becomes the victim. Is it in Ohio or something, the, the lady, the black lady that was, uh, was raped multiple times by a man and she turned and stabbed and killed the man and now she is being sued or in Iowa she's being sued and has to pay $150,000 to the family because it's on the books? Man, I applaud her. I'd sue them for a couple million for uh, mental distress. But suddenly the victimizer becomes a victim. But God's word says if somebody takes the life of another willfully, that person's life needs to end. Do you know that capital punishment is a deterrent to crime? If somebody knows that they're going to die by taking a life, then that person is probably going to think twice about it. I do believe there's innocent people in prison, no doubt. I've read stories and looked as you have. I believe that an officer, a police officer that falsifies or a prosecutor that falsifies information or tries to uh, cause information not to come in that would exonerate a person, that person or that officer ought to go to prison. I believe that. 
and if the process, this is my thoughts, if the process causes that person to lose their life, then the person who caused it ought to lose their life as well, whether it be officer, prosecutor, or judge. I believe that. There's no accountability. But if a person willfully takes somebody's life, the Bible says that their life is also to end. Now, how many agree that murder is wrong? Capital punishment, in accordance to God's word, is right. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Now he begins to, what some would say, he starts to meddle. You're starting to meddling here. Stick with the murder. Don't go on because when he goes on, he starts to talk about us as well. He says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now wait a minute. Are you saying that Murder is wrong and it's punishable, but if I, have a tongue, if I have a temper and I'm slanderous and I say these things, that that is put on the same level as murder. Well, let me just tell you what God says. Jesus really talking about a caution revealed here. A caution revealed. Here Jesus reveals that he knows what the Bible teaches, he knows what they have been taught, but he takes it a step further. Murder, murder as we know, is sinful and will face judgment. But Jesus reveals other actions that are in the same category as, as murder and will face judgment. He speaks about, now we don't like to hear this word, tempers. He speaks about someone who has a temper. How many of you don't poke your spouse? Don't look at somebody. How many know a Christian who has a bad temper? What does the Bible teach on it? We know murder's wrong, but what is God saying here about this? But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, the danger of a temper. Now, the inability to control our temper and become an angry with a brother also faces judgment. Again, I believe that we would all agree that murder is wrong and worthy of judgment, but what about a person's temper? Does God judge that? Yes, God does. You know, I'm not saying that God will judge you in the same exact way as murder, but the Bible says that God's judgment toward you is going to be harsh. The judgment of having a temper is wrong. Why? Because it is not Christ-like and it is not biblical. You know, typically, this is always the first stage of murder. A temper. A person doesn't come in singing kumbaya and happy as can be and say, you know what, I want to murder you. Usually behind every human tragedy is a long process of wrong thinking. Many people are in prison today because their tempers got the best of them. You can look at Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel because of his temper, of his sin against God. Now, there are three different types of judgment spoken about in this verse. Now here, the word judgment speaks of standing before uh, a lower court of 23. Kind of like uh, you really could say that it would be uh, almost like a supreme court in our day. Those who have difficulty with the temper are in danger of standing before the courts as a result of their anger. Now we have seen this proven time and time again. People act out in anger, anger and do things that they later regret. Boy, I, I probably shouldn't have said that. I, I probably shouldn't have done that, but I, I was really mad at the time. And we need to be very careful. Now, the danger of the tongue here, 
Now here Jesus continues to expand his discourse on murder. He reveals two aspects in regard to the dangers of the tongue. Again, if a person is angry with their temper, they need to give it to the Lord. How many of you have ever heard this illustration? I, I heard a person say, or in the illustration, that I'm like a shotgun. I just, it's a loud blast, it's over and everything is fine. But how many have ever seen the destruction that a shotgun does? It's loud, it's quick, and it disappears. But the destruction is forever. Parents lose their temper at a child and scream at them. Foolish. You shouldn't do that. The Bible says a soft answer turneth away wrath, a grievous word stir up anger. It talks about in, in, in Ephesians, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And we say, Boy, you children, you obey your parents, but we forget to read and provoke not your children to wrath. We need to use our words wisely. He's saying, Hey, if you have a temper. But then he goes on and he says, The word about slander. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. Now, we really don't have a good translation of that word, so it is transliterated as the original Hebrew word, which many believe is the word empty. Whatever the case, it was often used to show contempt or disdain for another. It was used in a slanderous way. You know, many times a man's anger would well up and he would begin to insult or slander his brother. I heard this phrase this last year, first time I've heard this. A drunk man's words is a sober man's thoughts. That's a good thought, isn't it? You could say that an angry man, temper, a temper uh, an angry man's words are really a man that's in control's thoughts. You ever see a man get drunk and, and they suddenly, whatever's in their brain, it just comes out. And then afterwards, they're like, oh, probably shouldn't have said that. But he's talking about slander here. Jesus warns of this type of behavior. It's just another step toward committing the act of murder. In essence, when one committed either of the acts that we've discussed it, he discussed he was as guilty in the eyes of God as the one who had committed the actual deed. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. As Christians, we ought to be different. As Christians, we ought to act different. We ought to talk different. We ought to think differently. You know, Jesus declared that these were in danger of the council, the Sanhedrin. Again, it's like our Supreme Court. You see the progression that Jesus reveals here. An unrestrained temper causes grievances that call for judgment in the courts. And as the progress is, the behavior reaches a level that they act out in a way that causes murder or harms somebody. Do you know that sin always travels in a downward spiral? Sin never goes up. Sin always takes a person a lot further than they want to go. He talks about a word of scorn here. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now Jesus has addressed their, Jesus has addressed their understanding of what constitutes murder. And here he reveals that those who call a brother a fool is in danger of hellfire or in danger of judgment like that. Now we must understand the context of what Jesus has said. The fool, the word fool in the text means stupid or dull. We get the word moron from this. How many of you have ever called someone a moron? And I mean, I'm not even talking about the person at the White House. I mean, I'm just using words here. We, we have, but I'll say a word about that here in a second. To call someone a fool was actually to call them stupid or godless. You stupid, godless person. You fool. Again, 
You've heard this word, sticks and stones may make my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is a lie straight from hell. Bones heal, words are hard to forgive. How many of you ever had something said to you years ago and you still remember it? You still remember what you were called or what was said about you or what was done? He said, you need to be careful with the words. You need to be careful with your speech. You need to be careful how you talk. So on the surface, it doesn't seem all that bad, but you must consider the attitude of the heart from which it was said. You know, if such is said from the heart of anger and contempt, you know, a parent, I've heard parents say to, their, to, to kids before, you stupid kid. You are nothing more than a moron. You are nothing more than an idiot. I can't even believe you're my child. Listen, the Bible says that that's on the same level of judgment. First of all, I don't think a parent ought to say that to their kids. Now, let me, let me say this. I'll just, a parenthesis. How many have ever said this? Boy, <laughs> that, no, that was stupid. What were you thinking? The act that was done was dumb. I mean, I'm not going to use myself as an illustration here uh, because we'd be here forever. How many have ever done something stupid and someone said, well, that was dumb. What were you thinking? You dummy. I did something the other day and oh, I just said, I'm not going to use myself as an illustration. I forgot to put, I hooked up a water line helping them put a, a reverse osmosis system in. And, and so I was in a basement, Tab was up above and and someone was there beside me helping, and, and all of a sudden, my, and we're on the phone, and he said, Hey, Dad, there's water running all over here. And it hit me. I forgot to hook up the, the overflow line. I'm like, You dummy. You idiot. Now, I wasn't talking to the person standing next to me or the person up there. I was talking about myself. You dummy. What, what were you thinking? Now, that's a light. Thing. There's been some other things that we, you would look and say, you are an idiot. And we laugh about it. But Christ isn't talking about that. He's talking about a heart attitude in our temper, in our speech, and in our words. Oh yeah, you can talk about murder and how wrong that is, and I agree with you, but I tell you it's just as wrong to use your tongue, to use your temper, to use your slander. God looks at it the same way. God's going to judge you in a very harsh way. You think you're up here, but God says what you're doing is wrong. See, we have no problem saying murder is wrong, but we excuse a bad temper. Well, they've always done that. That's the way they've always been. No, they don't always have to do it. There's a heart problem with it. We ought to be able to control our tongue. I don't believe a husband ought to scream at his wife. I don't believe a wife ought to scream at her husband. I don't believe that they ought to, man, we really had a fight last night. Why? Why? Why can't you sit down and talk about it? Remember uh, Buck and Sally Neal? Buck, he, he was funny. Uh, they're both home to be with the Lord. He'd say to me, he said, Pastor, he said, when we first got married, he said, uh, we came to an agreement that if we had an argument, whoever was wrong would take a walk around the block. He said, Pastor, I've walked around this block thousands and thousands of times. I said, so you're never right? He said, I'm married. I've taken a lot of walks before. They would joke back and forth. In talking, I'm not saying you don't have a disagreement. But Scripture tells us we ought not yell and scream. Scripture says that we ought to use our words wisely. You know, something that would help us, say, why don't we pray about this issue? You know, sometimes we ought to, and I know that I don't, you know, I, I know the words practice what you preach. I understand that. Sometimes we ought to think before we say something. So what, what, do you, what did you think of my cooking? Well, if you want me to be honest with you. No, she doesn't want you to be honest with her. This was very, very good. It was wonderful. Was it as good as your mother's? Now you're meddling. 
Let's just not push it. Let's stay in the house. Now, I know I'm being facetious here, but the fact is we ought to use our words wisely because God doesn't excuse wrong behavior. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, Psalm 1914. Let everything that I say be right. Now, God's people, as God's people, we must possess a heart of love and humility. Now, it is not sinful to see the actions of other people's sins as foolish. When God convicts a heart and that person turns on God and curses God and says, I will not bow to you, I will not accept you, I would say that person's a fool because the Bible says, uh, he says that, 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 that uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You take Jesus Christ when he overturned the money changers' tables. The Bible says that he was angry, but he did not sin. He was angry at what they were doing, but he himself controlled his heart. Folks, we need to control our heart. I don't like what's happening in our society. I don't like what's going on. And, and, and as I mentioned, Brother Steve, Brother Larry, you were out. We will discuss the proposals that are on the ballot and why a Christian. Let me say this. Any Christian who votes yes for Proposal 3 especially, you need to question your relationship with God. I'd say that to anybody. I, 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 I know that it would be wrong to say you need to question your salvation. This is wicked. We will discuss it. I don't care what they say. Democrats can say whatever they want behind the pulpit, but uh, conservatives somehow just can't. You know, as they talk about the foolish actions, the last thing here, in verses 23 through 26, the conduct required. Now, after Jesus explained the principles regarding murder and the seriousness of the actions of men associated with this behavior, He reveals, re reveals how we are to conduct ourselves in order to avoid such behavior. How do you avoid that behavior? He offers a simple illustration for us in verse 23 and 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. Now, Jesus is speaking of one's sensitivity to the leading and direction of the Holy Spirit. He is talking about worship here. He's dealing with the act of worship. The Spirit speaks to us as we worship. And if you come to the altar to offer worship, and you know that there's an issue with a brother, leave the worship and go deal with your brother in order to come before me right. Now there's a reason for this must seek the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is the one that leads us in worship. The Holy Spirit is one that talks to us and reveals the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the one that helps us uh, in true worship to God. Now, this is likely one of the greatest needs, I believe, is to submit ourselves, be willing to submit ourselves to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, the only way that a person can effectively be sensitive to his leading is to have lives free of sin. We need to keep a close account with God. We will never sense the direction and the, uh, uh, and the sensitivity and the leading of the Holy Spirit if we allow sin to control our lives. So he says, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. If you come to the altar... And you remember that you have ought against a brother, or a brother has ought against you, leave it there. And go deal with things, the purity. Leave thy gift, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. For the first be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Now here he addresses the priority of purity. One who is sensitive to the Spirit's leading will know that having a right relationship with our brother will allow us to have a right relationship with God. Now, he doesn't talk about, again, look at this. 
It says, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee. He doesn't bring up, what did the brother do to you? What did he say to you? What, what is going on between you? He say, no, if you remember there's a problem, well, bless God, you don't know what he did. You don't know what he said to me. God knows. I have found this to be true many times Someone who we have ought against or we feel has something against us doesn't even know or remember it, but we harbor it in our heart. And you go to that person and say, can I talk to you for a moment? I feel there's an issue here. This was said. I've had this happen. Pastor, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. And your fellowship is restored. You, you see what he is offering here. Now, he is talking about them. He, he's talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees here. He's saying, he speaks of making things right with one whom there is controversy rather than coming and worshiping in hypocrisy. He's saying, oh, you believe murder, you talk about all these things, but what about all of your rituals and your religious rituals? You come and worship God and, and, and you talk about all this thing, but yet you have problems in your life, sin in your life, you're a hypocrite. He said you need to be careful here. You need to have a pure, sensitive heart. What a profound lesson for all of us. How many times have we pretended to worship the Lord knowing there's issues in our life? Or knowing that there might be something between a brother. Now, we're not talking about brothers, although parents will do work very hard to make sure that, that, that the relationship is right. And say, hey, you need, you, need to, you need to ask for forgiveness or you need to forgive your brother or you need to, uh, to say something to them or sisters and, and siblings because if they're fighting in the home, there's issues. And, and it's going to be tension upon a lot of people and, and parents will say, make things right. Now, we had, uh, we have two boys and we had to deal with issues and, and uh, uh, my wife a, a couple times says, okay, listen, hold hands. <laughs> what? You need to hold hands and sit there holding hands. Man, they'll make things right real quick. He's talking about Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're saved, you're my brother and sister. And many times that's closer relationship than an actual biological sibling. He says, listen, you need to make sure things are right and have a pure heart, be sensitive to the Word of God. Jesus says we are to forsake a pretentious worship and seek reconciliation with our brother. When we have achieved that, then we are fit to come back and truly worship the Lord. Humility, the last thing here is humility. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost furthering. Jesus speaks of the futile efforts of arguing. And division. He said, it just never works out good. How many of you have ever looked at someone and said, listen, I'm just telling you, no good's going to come out of that. God said it to Cain. I know your heart. And if you continue, it's going to be bad. He said, sin lieth at the door. It's going to rule over you, and it did rule over. Why? He could not make things right with God. It always ends up costing more than wants to be paid. Now, it reveals that we are to seek harmony with our adversary rather than contention and strife. Anger and pride ought to stand in the way of godly living. Well, bless God, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be the first. 
I'm not going to go to that person. How many of you have ever, you don't have to raise your hand, but in your heart and mind, how many of you have ever forgiven somebody that did something against you and they didn't even ask for forgiveness? Why? You wanted to set yourself free. Because it would have control on you. Do you know that bitterness always burns the bridge to forgiveness? A person allows, Satan loves it. I know that it's often hard to humble ourselves, extend a hand of reconciliation to a brother or sister that has offended us, but that's exactly what God commands here. He said, listen, if a brother's offended you, or if you've offended a brother, you need to go to them and make it right. You need to, to do right. Why? Bitterness always ends in tragedy. If it is left unattended or unresolved, Satan will allow that to fester. Well, let's just put a Band-Aid over it. You know, if you have a pain or you have a problem and, and you're running a fever, say, well, you know, or a high blood pressure. Well, just take blood pressure medicine. That's all you need to take and it will lower it. Well, why not deal with the issue? Why not deal with the problem? And God says, don't cover it. Treat it. How do you treat it? With a humble heart, the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, oh, you think murder's bad. And I agree. But all of this is just as bad. If we are Christians, we ought to be different. We ought to act different, talk different. We ought to speak differently. Everything about us. These are not the easiest verses, I know, but they do reveal great truths. Many times we harbor anger and bitterness in our hearts against those we ought to love. We allow something. You know, let me say this as a side note. Never believe what someone comes and tells you about what somebody else said about you. Be very careful. Most of the time, something is always added or left out. They're going to tell it in a way that sounds good in their eyes. And I, and I have seen, I've heard, I've experienced. Pastor, you said this. I did not say that. You said this. I said, no, I said this. That was in there. But if you put the whole thing together, it changes the whole story. We need to seek God's counsel. You say, well, are you pointing anything out? I'm not, but if the Holy Spirit points something out, spend some time with the Lord. Say, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide me. For unity's sake, I do not know of any problems in the church. I will say that. But teaching through, he's talking about, you believe in this, but be very careful with this. I know a lot of Christians, though, who have bad tempers, and we ought not. We ought to have the right tongue. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this morning, your goodness, and the teaching on your word and how convicting it is to me. And so often we, we look at the tree, but we never see the forest because we're so close to it. Lord, if we just step back, we could see so many other things. And if we allow your word to reveal truth, it'll reveal truth in our own hearts, areas that we have to deal with or that we have to constantly protect. Lord, I pray that you will be with us here this morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Nobody's looking around. Maybe someone here this morning said, Pastor, would you pray?